Coming up on episode 57 of Create If Writing, we are talking blog design basics. I can't go back to sleep, it's almost light. These restless thoughts have kept me up again. Hey everyone, and welcome to Create If Writing, the podcast for writers, bloggers, and creatives who want to build an online platform without being smarmy. I'm your host, Kirsten Oliphant, and I would like to think that I'm 100% smarm free, but I think if I'm being honest, there's probably a little smarm in there sometimes. I don't know. I've been thinking this week about that. If I've ever done things, and I know I have, uh, but recently, have I done anything that I'm like later, you know, you do something sometimes and you're like, oh, I'll try this new method or tactic. And then you're like, that felt gross. Uh, so I don't know if you guys have experienced that, but I was thinking about that this week because I am helping promote Nick Stevenson's next launch of his Your First 10K Readers course. And as a part of that, he is sending out these really great freebies and you can find those on the blog, uh, actually in the show notes, I'll leave the link to this video, but it's uh, createifwriting.com forward slash 057. And uh, this week he has a video about why people don't buy and also how to get them to buy without feeling sleazy. And this really <laughs> resonated with me because obviously like I don't want to be sleazy. And I feel like usually I feel the other direction, like <laughs> I'm too apologetic when I sell things like you know, you don't need my course, but uh, if you feel like buying a course today, whatever, you know, do it, don't do it, it's cool, whatever. Um, <laughs> that's where I think if I were left to my own devices, that's how I would sell things. And so I'm learning, and I feel like I've learned a lot this year. I've actually gotten a couple of emails from people saying they want to learn from my style of selling, and I was like, what? Okay, so I'm learning to sell, I guess. But if I were left to my own devices, I'd go that way. But after reading, observing, and kind of learning sales stuff online, I think it was really easy to slip into that perfect pitch, I don't know, salesy type of thing that everybody does. And you kind of just try it on. And I tried it on a couple of times and was like, yeah, this is a really itchy sweater. <laughs> this is not going to work. And so now I'm trying to figure out what's what's my perfect spot of selling to people, but not being smarmy. So anyway, that was totally unplanned in the middle, beginning of this episode, but it just, it got me thinking as we were talking about SMARM as I introduced the show, because that has become the tagline for the show. And I think that word SMARMY has become my word and has really resonated with a lot of you guys. And so if you're feeling like I'm feeling where you want to be someone who can sell things, whether that's your novels or your courses or coaching package, or even getting people to sign up for your email and keep visiting your blog or go read your blog post Sometimes all that marketing stuff, it just feels icky. And it's really not icky to share awesome stuff with your readers. But I think we can get icky if we're doing things that don't feel comfortable for us, that are um, kind of using tactics that we learn from other people that don't fit our people and ourselves and the kind of content we create. And so we all have to find that perfect space of what does not feel smarmy. And there's probably a big sliding scale. But I am writing a post, actually, I'm collecting ideas of things that people do that are smarmy that you can avoid. So that's coming one day soon. Not yet, but soon. So, okay, back to what I actually wrote down that I'm going to talk about today in episode 57. Um, I have an interview with Elaine Griffin of Elaine Griffin Designs, and she actually helped me when I very first moved over to WordPress. And I think that was in 2013, so three years ago. And I had come from Blogger and had just figured out enough HTML to be dangerous over there. And uh, so moving over, I could not figure out for the life of me what the heck to do with WordPress. Like it just, everything about it confused me. To be honest, some things still confuse me. But Elaine, uh, we connected through Roller Derby, which is crazy. And we don't even live in the same city. Like she's in New York. I'm in Houston. And somehow we found each other on Twitter from Derby. I don't know, whatever. And so she did a great job helping me, even though I've actually changed a lot and just rebranded uh, my KirstenOliphant.com site, which is the one that she helped with. And uh, I learned enough from her and working with her that when I launched Creative Writing, I went ahead and did it myself. And I did have to email her a couple of times. And I probably will always have somebody on call that I email when I break my blog, 
which I inevitably do. So shout out to Mary Dennis <laughs> this week, who uh, in a pinch really helped me when I forgot what I did this time. Man, what did I do? I don't know. I did something and it was terrible. It, oh, it was my header. I, I tried to kind of plug in a header that would work mobily. And Elaine had put in a great theme and some great plugins for me, but she had also done some custom CSS. And so I just tried to dive into the CSS and add things like, okay, here's what she did. I'll just add in a new image here. And it did not work. And so I ended up, either my site looked great on desktop or mobile, but not both, definitely not both. Anyway, so she helped a lot. And then uh, Stephanie Jones of journey.com really helped a lot as well. So I kind of reached out to those two people. You've got to have somebody that you know that does design stuff on speed dial. You just need them or Facebook Messenger or something. And the best way, I this is my tip before we even get into that interview, but my tip would be connect with some of those people through blogger groups and online groups. If you want to cut into the creative writing group, Mary Dennis is in there and she's answering questions left and right. And I'm telling people, go ask Mary if they ask me because I again, know enough to be dangerous. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the thing with blog design is this, even if you're not a primary blogger, like if blogging is not how you define yourself, you, if you define yourself as a writer or business person, but you have a blog, either way, you have a site, you have a website, and it needs to have certain elements that people are drawn to. And that when they come to your site, it looks professional, it draws them in rather than repels them. So you are either going to spend time or money maybe both. <laughs> In my case, it's both because I do the time to do it myself and then I have to pay somebody to fix my mistakes. But one of the two, so you need to decide, okay, is this something I'm going to learn? And I kind of learned over time and then also still have somebody that I can pay to fix things when I break it. Um, or do you want to just pay someone and never have to worry about how to do your own blog? So these are things to think about. This interview with Elaine was one of the ones from the Business to Blogger podcast. And so it's from last year, but the things are still applicable that we talk about. And I've got some great notes over the show notes, some suggestions from Elaine that I hope will be really helpful. And most of it relates to WordPress. And we do talk about why you might want to choose WordPress over Blogger, even though for years I loved Blogger. I can't imagine going back now, but for years I loved it. So uh, no, no hate on the Blogger people out there. Um, especially if you've been there since it was Blogspot. If you guys remember that, raise your hand if you remember when it was Blogspot. So that's the interview that's coming up from Elaine. And this is sponsored by Holly Homer. And Holly was one of the founders of Business to Blogger. And so I got her permission to repurpose this content. And I don't know if you'll hear this or not in the replay, but uh, I need doors on this room where I record. My dog just walked in with his toenails. So fantastic. Um, drinking game. Every time you hear the dog toenails, take a shot of something or drink a coffee. Um, but in any case, this is sponsored by Holly Homer, who gave me the permission to repurpose these podcast episodes and interviews that I did for Business to Blogger because its site's not there anymore. And so I'm really thankful to Holly. And if you want information, especially on Facebook, but Facebook blogging, all kinds of online stuff. She is so savvy and has built several sites, several giant social media pages, including Quirky Mama, which has over 2 million page likes, which is insane that she got without paying for ads, like just straight up organic, which is really hard to do. And it wasn't like, it wasn't from the age of before organic reach died. It was actually after that. So she knows how to work some stuff online. So if you want to learn a lot of things, you can head over to hollyhomer.com. Thank you, Holly, for being our sponsor couple things before we get into the interview. This is way more things than I thought I would pack into this, but um, I did want to give some shout outs to people I have been loving. I asked you guys, I guess last week for um, just to tag me if you want to take a picture of where you're listening to the podcast. And so Anna Wilson, who is at Peacock in a Pair on Twitter, left a picture and she said, catching up with my favorite podcast while cutting out a weird shirt. And I don't remember, I think Anna is from England, and she does have the English spelling of favorite, which I always feel like I should say it favorite, although I know British people don't say it like that, but whenever there's a U in it, that extra U, and so she's got this shirt cutting out that's got like the old school Batman, you know, when Batman was blue and gray, like that cartoon Batman, Aquaman, and Superman, so I don't know what she's making, but that's pretty cool, so thanks for listening and tagging me, and then Brenna, who is at 
Mining for Cake on Twitter said, I listened to Creative Writing with Lola, my hula girl, on my way home from work. And so she has a picture of her dashboard. I'm sure she was not driving while taking the picture. Who does that? I say that because I just took a picture while driving this week. I didn't really. I didn't. Don't call the cops. I I just had to. But she is stationary in this, in this picture, and I can learn from her. But no one take pictures while you're driving your car. Note to everyone, including myself. So thank you guys for that. A few people actually did this in the Facebook group, and I didn't pull them up in time. But if you guys tag me on Twitter, I am really slow these days because we're still not through the summer yet. So I'm just over on with kids. My response time on Twitter, if I were a customer service rep, I would be fired. But to uh, kind of reference uh, Last of the Mohicans, I will find you and your tweet and eventually respond to you. So thank you guys for listening. And speaking of listening, and this is the last thing, and then we're going to dive into the interview. What is, This is the longest intro like ever. Um, last week, I did two episodes. I actually am starting to do them on Mondays now. And so I have my interview Monday with Amy Lynn Andrews. And then on Thursday, I did kind of a mini episode that was all about affiliate marketing and kind of affiliate launches and how those work. And I don't know if it, I would just want to see like, okay, what happens if I do two podcasts in a week? And I went and checked my stats like just now before recording this. And I was shocked because first I saw my monthly and I was like, hey, my monthly for August, which is half over, is higher than last month, which is crazy. And then I went in and looked and three times as many people listened to that affiliate uh, podcast episode as anybody listens to my other ones. Like it was three times my normal amount of downloads, which is crazy. So I'm going to have to kind of reverse engineer this and see if I shared it more places or if people are just more interested in affiliate launches and how that looks behind the scenes. I'm not sure which is which. So I'll try to kind of push this one out to the same places that I pushed that one out. And we'll see if I just did some extra things or if you guys were just really interested. But anyway, I'm glad if you're one of the people that listened maybe for the first time to that episode, I hope you stick with me. I'm really glad you're here. And again, reach out Kiki Mojo on Twitter. So I'm going to go now and stop talking and let you listen to this interview with Elaine so you can get some blog design basics to make sure that your site is not repelling your ideal audience. In today's episode, we have Elaine Griffin from Elaine Griffin Designs. How are you doing, Elaine? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. I've worked with Elaine for two years now, I think, on on different blogs, and she has been a great resource and is very knowledgeable about the field. So I wanted her to come talk to us today just about blog design, some of the basics, and some of the reasons why you might want to hire a designer versus doing DIY. So Elaine, how did you get into blog design? Well, I was designing websites. I um, was a stay-at-home mom and had a little business where I made children's clothing. And I worked with a designer on my website and I loved it. And so I decided that that's what I wanted to do. So I learned how to do that. I was building HTML sites. Um, This was before I knew anything about WordPress. And then I started blogging and became familiar with WordPress. And um, that's how I started designing blogs. Okay. And you design pretty much exclusively for WordPress, not Blogger. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, I don't do Blogger. And is there a reason why you would recommend that people use WordPress instead of Blogger? Well, I personally think that it's easier to use. I think it's more, um, once you get used to it, it's more user-friendly as far as actually writing your posts. To me, it looks just like Microsoft Word. So, you know, most people use that. And I just feel like it's, it's easier, it's better to... Uh, because you can get plugins to use to increase the functionality and have it pretty much do whatever you want. Yeah, I think for those of you listening who are on Blogger out there, I was there and a lot of people have been there. And I don't think, I know, I know there are people who are professionals who are using Blogger. So don't feel like you have to change. But for me, what I felt like when I used Blogger is it was very user friendly for the beginner. And I was able to kind of fudge things a little bit more easily with than I could with WordPress once I switched. But at the same time, there are so many functions in WordPress that you don't have access to in Blogger. So to me, if someone is kind of asking, you know, those plugins and some of those things are just are pretty much the reason why I would switch because the functionality is so different. So e- Blogger might be easier as you're starting out and you want to customize and you don't know web design. But down the road, there are so many features that you just 
can't get, I don't think, in, in Blogger. Or you have to find a workaround that's a lot more difficult than... Right. Well, the other thing, too, is being in control of your content. And yes. if you are on Blogger or, a, you know, WordPress, the free version of WordPress, WordPress.com, you are not in control of your content. And I read a blog recently where they were saying, well, that's not really true. And if you read what Blogger says, then, the, you know, X, Y, and Z, they don't own your content, but they can delete your blog. And that's what's happened to people, I think. So whether or not whoever actually has the ownership of your words, and I would say you still do, but Blogger can take your blog out. And that's not something you want to happen. So talking, thinking about design and uh, a lot of the bloggers that I know, whether it's with Blogger or WordPress, are doing kind of the hacks you know, of figuring out how to fudge HTML or CSS and kind of get the things they want without a designer. So what would you say as far as when somebody needs to hire a designer or when they can just kind of do the DIY version? Well, I think if you want to do the DIY version, you are going to want to make very little changes. You want to find a theme that you can really just kind of go with and maybe just add your own header, your, um, maybe change just a little bit of the color or the fonts. I think that when you, if you really want to brand your, your blog, brand yourself, um, you need to hire a designer, someone who can not only design the site, but help with your logo design. And, you know, when, when you get hacking things or you're adding a lot of plugins, to increase the functionality, you know, there's a fine line there and you, while the plugins are great and being able to hack things are, is fine, you know, you might be affecting the function uh, and the speed of your blog and you don't want a slow loading site. Yeah, that's a great point. And I think, you know, I feel like whenever I sort of delve into something, if I haven't called you, because I do feel like I call you with these emergencies <laughs> when I call, but, um, you know, I'll kind of dive in and it's like, say a prayer for me, I'm going into CSS and I don't know what's going to happen when I come out. And I haven't fully broken my blog, but I have done some things where I had to call you and make help. You know, I, I don't, you know, there's a limit to my knowledge as far as what I can hack. And, and that's a great point that you might be messing something up that you don't know, or there might be something on the back end. And if you don't know the back end or why that's important, you know, you're not going to know that you've had this effect on your blog. So I think that's a really important exactly. distinction yeah. more than ever now that we're mobile friendly. So what would you say about people trying to get mobile friendly and what, what advice do you have as far as that, that whole thing goes? I would say, make sure that you're choosing a really good theme. Um, that it's really mobile responsive and current up to date uh, with newest devices. For example, I've noticed that um, I've had to do s more workarounds for the uh, new iPhones for other devices. So you want to make sure that when you, if you've chosen a theme already, you want to go and, and test it. Uh, I use the site called responsinator.com, and it has all sorts of, you just type in your website address, and it pulls up all the devices, and you can see what it looks like um, from an iPad in, you know, a horizontal view or a vertical view, phones, horizontal, vertical. You might, and you want to make sure that it's current and up to date with what uh, the device sizes are right now. That's great, and that's one of those things that sometimes is difficult to know. Um, you know, I, I like that site. I'll leave that in the show notes so people can find it because I just switched computers. I One of my children poured water on my laptop, which is oh. one of those wonderful things. And it actually didn't fully break, but three keys don't work. <laughs> and, and it's like E, W, and Q. And I, I you, you just need your E's. So I'm going <laughs> to see if I can fix it. But I switched computers in that time and I was shocked at how different my website looked. The colors looked different. The sizing of yeah. some of the things looked different. And I didn't feel like the two computers I was using were that different from each other but my site looked very different so responsinator.com is a great a great tool to use so what are some of the themes that are mobile friendly or that you've had good success with well i pretty much exclusively use uh genesis okay um by studio press and most of their current themes are mobile responsive there's, you have to do very little uh, to make them mobile responsive. The only issue with that is I have to do a lot of mobile response coding for headers. 
you know, now that I have been doing that for so long, it's kind of like second nature to me and I've learned what works and what doesn't. The thing about the Studio Press themes is they like, they like real small logos on there or they like for you to use um, just your, just text that you, so it would be the name of your website. And so they don't have that mobile response header necessarily coded in because they haven't coded it for you to be using a big header. Okay. Okay. So the header then yeah. really can make a, a difference and impact. What about, what about ads? Does this mobile friendly affect the ads, especially if somebody has an ad up in the header or how is that just solve itself or do you have to do any special coding for that? Usually they size down. I have, worked with a couple of sites and I cannot remember the name of the ad site um, but it's it was a plug-in and I have some sometimes they display on the front page in post um, in truncated posts and that throws it way off but I haven't really had any problems with um, ads in the header I think that most of the companies that are providing the code for those are are coding them so they will shrink down. Okay, that's good. Yeah, I visited a site recently on my phone and I couldn't even see the site. I mean, it was like tiny and there was, it was just like one giant ad and there was no text. And I thought that's why Google wants everything to be mobile friendly. I don't even know what I'm looking at. So yeah, exactly. well, I think even just in the discussion so far, we're getting a little bit of this answer to my next question. Um, but what is it that people are getting when they pay for a designer? Clearly, we're getting somebody who's going to help code our headers and things that we may not know how to do. But what are people getting when they are hiring a designer? Mm-hmm. Well, people are really, you know, getting the expertise of design and what how things should be placed, where your ads should be, um, how big your header really should be that, you know, you might not, you might be really wedded to a design that has this huge graphic in the header and it's pushing all of your content down and when you're doing that you know your your ad or your ads and your content really need to be as close to or above the fold as possible so it's just things like that um things like you know where people are going, where things should be placed because um, we know like where people are going to look first on your blog. Um, so where the important information needs to go, how that is going to look with the rest of your design. Um, so, And then it's also the technical aspects, the back end as we were talking about. Um, what are the best plugins to use? What's going to bog your site down? What's not going to bog your site down? Where do you put special code for some special ads? Some, some code needs needs to go in certain places. Um, and then, you know, down the line, um, I know I offer this. I don't know um, if every designer does, but support. You know, when you have an emergency and you are say, oh, my gosh, I just broke my blog. Can you help me? <laughs> You've definitely gotten that kind of email from me before, I know. <laughs> I know. I get a lot. And, I, and it, it doesn't, you know, I do offer a specific support package. But for the most part, things that are just going to take me a few minutes. And most of the time, what people, when people, you know, send out an SOS, it literally is like a five-minute thing. But for us, it's not a five-minute thing. And again, that's why... That's why you want to go with a designer because what would take you hours could take you five minutes. And, you know, we're talking about time here. I think when people, you know, for blogs, I think there is a sense if you're doing this as a business, it's an investment and there are certain things you invest in and your time is also very valuable. So if people are kind of balking at the idea of hiring a designer or think I could do this to a certain point, and maybe you could, and maybe you could work with a designer and say, I want to do everything up to this point, but I need help with you know, X, Y, and Z, and maybe they could get a different kind of package from you, but your time is valuable and you don't want to spend it doing blog design if that's not your thing. And also you might mess it up and have to call someone anyway to come and do it. But I think your blog is an investment. And so if you're thinking about wanting to be very branded, if you're thinking about wanting to make money on your blog, you have to put some money in and blog design is one of those places where I feel like it's really important, especially in this day and age where everything is very visual. And I know many of you listening have probably been to a blog or two. There's some personal preference things, but you've probably been to a blog or two where you just look at it and you go, ugh. So Elaine, what are some of the things that are personal pet peeves or things you hate to see or things that will make you click away immediately when you hit a blog? A huge header, like I was saying before. Um, It's just, I 
I just, I don't, I hate it. <laughs> um, too much navigation, too. You know, I, I'm okay with two nav bars, two areas of navigation. In fact, I would much prefer people have two areas, maybe above the header and below the header. Um, okay. And split it up because, you know, you really don't want more than a few items on each navigation. And the other thing, too, are the buttons. The, not only the grab my button code stuff, because nobody's grabbing your button. I'm no, sorry. no one does that sorry, anymore. Everyone. Sorry, I hate <laughs> to be the bearer of bad news. But also just the badges saying that, you know, you've been featured on this site or that site. I think a couple are okay. You know, no more than a few. Make, sh make the really impressive ones be on your sidebar. Um, and then if you have a lot that you just really are, ins you insist that you really want to have them displayed somewhere because you're proud and that's cool. You know, in the footer is a good place to put them or dedicate a page to it and say, these are the places, you know, have a media page. This is where I'm featured yeah. links to the articles and that's great. But those are, those are like my three things. Yeah. I, I think I was tr just thinking as you were talking, I feel like I've seen people putting some of those badges, like the Liebster award and some of these things that, you know, not to knock some of these awards, especially for smaller blogs, but yeah, if it's not important or significant or going to make somebody mm -hmm. feel really impressed with you, then you just don't need it maybe in the sidebar. And you think about that, someone mentioned to me one time to think about your sidebar and all those content areas as real estate and it's valuable. And so what are you putting in there and what are you doing to keep people on your site? You know, what are you having in the sidebar that's keeping people, you know, engaged with your content? Are, do you have any suggestions for, for that kind of thing? Like, do you prefer... And again, some of this is personal, but do you prefer like text links, like recent posts in the sidebar or images to categories or popular posts or, or do you like none of those things? I don't use them for myself, but I, I prefer to use that area for my social media personally. But um, okay. but to keep people on your site, yeah, I, I've definitely, I've seen, and I know that you do it on your personal site and I've, I'm setting up a site right now that has links to different categories and they're set up like um, big block buttons. It's kind of nice actually. And I've set up a few like that. There was a, a blog that I did that I designed a few months ago and she had she's an artist and so she had her own art that she had images of that she used as buttons to different areas of her site and that was lovely. Um, so yeah, I mean anything you can do to keep it you know, not only on your site, but just in your, any kind of, any of your sites, you know, your social media, those are your websites also. What can people do? Like if they can't afford a, blo uh, a designer, if they're just starting out and can't afford a designer, what are some things that you would recommend to make their blogs look professional, even though they're kind of being simple and having to do it themselves? Just don't be afraid of the white space really. Just don't get crazy with backgrounds and don't get crazy with huge header graphics. Um, just keep it nice and simple, easy breezy. Use good fonts. Um, Google fonts has some great fonts. Some of them are starting to get a little tired out. You know, I'm looking at you, lobster, but you know, there are some <laughs> other... <laughs> there are some other really nice ones I actually noticed the other day that um, in the script fonts they had some new ones that I hadn't seen you know the big huge images are great I love you can use stock photos if you have a knack for photography use your own photos but use big images in your not only in your posts but on your front page and your with your truncated posts I think that adds a lot of um, pizzazz if you don't have a whole lot of design going on okay so great images and I think those are good suggestions that using stock photos or taking your own photos if you can. And if you're not a great photographer or don't feel like you are, I mean, that's a great skill to brush up on, especially, you know, if you want to be like a food photographer or even like a craft photographer, I'd say you take a class, you can do that. But images, we are such a visual people. And these days there are so many people blogging and so many people doing images really well that even if you're not going to compete with someone who takes insane images, you can at least have yours look professional. And I think adding a filter, whether you're using PicMonkey or Canva or Photoshop even, but adding some kind of filter to your photos to make them 
you know, stand out, to be artistic or to be branded to your site, I think is a great idea. Um, or, or again, there's lots of free stock photography, but I think, you know, you don't want to use something that you're seeing used everywhere else. And there was a site, I'm trying to remember what it was, somebody shared it recently, maybe it was in the use letter from Amy Lynn Andrews, but there was a site with stock photos and I went and everything was really beautiful and I downloaded a few and hadn't used them. And then I noticed the same photos on like five different sites like that week. So everybody, I guess, went and got those and, you know, they looked great on all the sites, but you, you want to be a little distinct. And so that's when it gets hard, I think, with the stock photos, yeah. especially if they're free. One question about fonts. So Google fonts, are those all free for commercial use? Google fonts are free for um, commercial use. Okay. Yes, personal and that's one yep. of those things that you may not think about, especially if you're just starting out or even I'd been blogging for a few years before someone mentioned that a lot of the fonts that you can download from, is it Font Squirrel or there's a few other sites. Font Squirrel, the font. Yeah, the font. I'd used both, to the, both of those before, but they may be free for you to use, but they're not supposed to be used commercially. And, not, and that doesn't apply to all the fonts, but you just need to know. And that's one of those things you may not know. And so I feel like it's safer to go ahead and use Google fonts because you know that it's safe if you're selling things on your site. I always feel like yeah. I'm small enough. No one's going to come after me. But if they do, I don't want to get in trouble for right, exactly. doing something wrong. Let's just, you know, and then if you blow up, you don't have to go change all these things because suddenly exactly. you're important. Well, and you know, you can find, you can purchase fonts and I do it occasionally. Um, I, I think it's, is it fonts.com or, uh, you know, whatever, but the, you can find different fonts that are really reasonably priced. They always have some that are on sale. Some are like 90% off. Um, you know, you buy it for 10 bucks and then it's yours and you can use it, you know? So don't be afraid to buy some once in a while too. And that, yeah, that would be nice. I think for like you're saying, some of the fonts get really tired out, and you see kind of some of the same ones everywhere. So if you want to set yourself apart and have branding, you know, maybe buying one of those fonts that you make sure you're going to love it though, because that's the thing is you you don't want to pull too many changes on people all the time. But find a font that you love and maybe purchase that, and that could be sort of what sets you apart. And that's another reason I would want to ask a designer, because sometimes I really like things and no one else does. And so it's a good idea to be personal, but you want to ask maybe someone who has a good eye if they have a recommendation or if they think that font, or if even if it's legible or, you know, will look right. good on mobile. Those are things to think about as well. So what are some of your favorite WordPress um, you talked about, I think, Genesis being the one that you use as far as a framework and the themes that come with that. But what are some of your favorite sort of plugins or tools that you use for blog design? Genesis has a huge amount of plugins that I just have a, a standard kind of setup that I always use. <laughs> um, but the other one that I like for um, for social media follow buttons is Simple Social Icons. Love it. It do, I mean, that's exactly what it is. Simple social icons. They can be square. They can be round. They can have rounded edges. They can now have a border. That's a new thing that they've done. But they have it all. The, you just put the plug-in into your sidebar. You put your link in every area, you know, whichever areas you want. You change the colors, and that's it. I just, I don't believe in, well, it's not that I don't believe. Sometimes there's a place for it if you really want them. But I don't think you really need super fancy social follow buttons. And so I like to just have it, you know, you can control the size easily. It's really easy if you want to DIY, that's for sure. The other plugin that I really like and I use a lot uh, is called Short Codes Ultimate. And this plugin allows you to put in, a, it's, I can't even, I don't even know how many different short codes you can use, like 25 or 50, I, get, I don't even know. But anything from, um, I use an accordion a lot, so if I have a lot of information I want to display, I use it on my site. So um, I've got my services page sectioned off, and it's like a, a header with a colored background, and you just click on it. It's got the little plus, you click on it, and it pulls it down, and there, there's the information. So there's all my information about WordPress design. Then there's another one about like logo and branding, and then there's another one about add-ons. So I use the accordion, and you can use it for galleries, and you can use it to insert video and audio, and uh, a lot of different things. So I'm loving. It. It's so awesome. It's so awesome. The other one that I think is a must is called Black Studio Tiny MCE. 
I believe. They have a read, they have a few different plugins, but that one in particular gives you the option instead of just having a regular text widget, you can it gives you a uh, uh, text widget that has an editor so it's looks instead of just typing your information in you can't and you have to do a bunch of HTML yourself to format anything this looks just like if you were creating a post or a page and so that way too this is where it's beautiful I love it so you can put in the um, the vi and then the visual editor text uh, widget and then you can also use your short codes ultimate plugin with it because that just goes right into the text editor, that short code, code's ultimate. So really increases the functionality. Well, what are some of the ones that you said you have a standard a bunch that you put in with Genesis? And a lot of people use that. So what are some of the ones that you use every time with that? Uh, the Genesis eNews Extended. So that one is for your signups. And you can use MailChimp with it, or you could use FeedBurner. Um, and that gives an, it's beautiful, it's got a beautiful button, a nice box um, with a background, pretty, you know, out of the box without customizing it, it looks really good. Oh, well, I think that's the one that we've got on my personal site. And I will tell you, if you're a MailChimp user, you know that those little boxes that MailChimp makes, I'm sorry, MailChimp, they're terrible. And they're really difficult to customize. I tried to do it and I spent an hour. Mm -hmm. And again, thinking about your time is money. That was just a wasted hour. And then it didn't even work. And, you know, I was following some YouTube video. And so we installed the eNews Extended with Genesis and that's been great and it makes it beautiful and I didn't have to spend an hour of my time trying to code something that didn't even work. So yeah, especially if you're using MailChimp or something else, like you want your site, you don't, you want people to sign up for your email. You want that to be beautiful and noticeable in the right way. Absolutely. Yep. Um, the other one that I really like is the featured widget Amplified. This one, so Genesis comes with a standard featured widget uh, section, which is fine, but there, there's a little bit more functionality to the featured widget Amplified. And what you would do on that, uh, for most of the Genesis themes, for the front page they have like a top section maybe, and maybe a middle section, and that's where you can feature your posts, your content on your homepage. So um, I use the featured widget Amplified to filter what posts are shown in what what area. So for example, it could be simple like um, I'm gonna put this plugin in the top area and it's going to be just my latest post and you set it up to just have your latest post show. And then I'm going to take another one of the featured widget because you can use it as many times as you want and put it under that and then I'm gonna set it up to show the most recent 10 posts. Or like on your site, what I did, I used the featured widget Amplified to filter by category. Yes, yes, which I love so that people, if they come, because I've got a lifestyle blog that's, I mean, everything from parenting to roller derby to food and some people, you know, I, I'm going to write about it all. I don't, you know, that's just where my blog is for my personal site. But some people don't care about certain things and they just want to read one of my categories. And so I think that's a great function to have, especially if you're a lifestyle blog and you have a few kinds of categories that are different from one another. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And you can, and you know, that right in there are the options to say, you know, how many posts you want to show, what featured image, you know, how, how big your featured image is, whether you want to link that says read more, whether you want to link the title to the actual blog post, um, if you want to offset a certain amount of, so say you don't want the last post to show or uh, you don't want if you, if it's already shown with another widget you don't want it to show again and you know just there's all sorts of options there probably not explaining it very well but that the, the upshot is there's a lot of options and it's great no I think that makes sense and that sounds very functional for people who want to have control over what people see when they yep. land on their site which I think is a really important thing because you know if you check out you know the typical bounce rate is pretty high um, for, for most sites, I would say. And what that means is people go and they either, A, get exactly what they want from that particular page, which is great because you've given them what they want, or they click on and then they leave for whatever reason, which right. is not what you want. <laughs> so anything you can do to control kind of what 
happens when people land on your site to keep them there, either giving them the information they want or hopefully sort of trapping them into reading more and more. And, you know, if that's ever happened to you, that's that's when you know that you found a great blog. If you go to click on a site, like, you know, sometimes I'll just test when I'm pinning something to make sure that that goes to an actual site and not some scraper or something. And then if I get lost on that blog, you know, and suddenly an hour later, I'm like, oh, I've been reading this blog for an hour. You need to maybe pay attention to what what the blog looks like, what they've done to keep you there. And those are things that you probably want to replicate on your blog. And sometimes you just click with certain blogs. I mean, there's definitely a personal aspect to it, but there's also just truth to the idea that we are visual people and we, you know, we like personality, but there's a certain way people want things to look. And with that in mind, are there certain things that you would say blogs should absolutely avoid in terms of, you know, very basic design or that they should absolutely have in terms of very basic design? You absolutely, I mean, I think I talked a little bit about what to avoid with too many badges and your nets and, and, but so, so, what you absolutely have to have is your uh, some sort of a header with your site name on it, and it should be not the standard font that comes with your theme. <laughs> Change it, <laughs> even if you don't have a, like a great outstanding graphic logo. Use a nice color and use a nice font. Okay, so don't use you know a lot of the time on the Genesis themes it's Oswald. Don't yeah. don't use that. Change it. Um, and then the social media follow buttons. You have gotta have them. You gotta have them. Um, you have to have social sharing buttons on all of your posts. The about section really should be pretty clear in your sidebar. And some people say um, you should really have your email address listed if you're right there on your about section or in your header. If you're interested in working with brands, especially, um, I guess sometimes brands they brand representatives do not like to actually go to a contact form. They want to save your email and and email you directly from their uh, email client. And then the last thing that you definitely have to have, and we've been saying this for a couple years, but now it's definitely true with the Google algorithm, is you really need to be mobile responsive. Yeah, and that's something, you know, very easy to test for. And we can leave a link for that if you haven't already tested your blog to make sure that you're mobile friendly and, it, and it's changed. So if you were mobile friendly like a month ago, it might be different because they just updated that recently as we're recording this. And so you may be listening and it's been a month or two since they've done that and it's old news, but either way, just, just test to make sure because you want Google to be indexing you. You want to be found. Yep. And I want to stress with the mobile response that don't use a plugin for that. Don't use Jetpack, Jetpack's little mobile um, thing that they option that they have and don't download a, a plugin that makes it mobile responsive because Google has said that well they have a standard about what they think they believe mobile response is and that is not changing the design at all it's your design should be sizing down and uh, that's not what you're doing with a plugin now I've heard some people say that they go to Google's mobile response test site and their Google says oh great your site is mobile responsive even though they've used a plugin but that is in that does not correlate with what they have said which is mobile response is sizing it down coding it to do what it's supposed to do so be, be wary of that Interesting. So people want it to be coming through a theme that is mobile friendly then if the plugin is the wrong way to go? Right. Okay. So do the theme. That's great information. I don't, I don't always know. And this is why I like talking to people who know more than I do because, you know, I might just say, oh, it's easy to do a plugin and have that. And then Google says I'm mobile friendly, but then I'm still losing out on some of that search traffic and I don't know why. And that, right. that might be why. Using mobile. I mean, it's just, you have to be you know, the other thing about it, too, is that if you've gone to the trouble to create a brand and you even if you've just chosen some nice colors and some nice fonts, you're still creating a brand. So why would you want to strip all of that away from your mobile site? You know, that's true. That makes a lot of sense. Well, to finish up, I want to talk about what it's like to work with a blog designer. So if someone out there listening is going to use a designer, what are some great tips for working well with a designer or picking a designer even and, and, you know, having a good relationship? I feel like that's, you want to have a good relationship with your blog designer, right? You want to have somebody who understands you and also someone 
that you know you can reach and all those kinds of things. So from the designer's standpoint, what would you recommend as far as, you know, picking somebody that you can work well with or tips for working well with a designer? I, I think that it is really important to know that your personalities are not going to clash. So it's not just about whether you like their desi- design aesthetic. Um, it's, it's also about how well you get along. If you could be friends with them, then you, it'd be okay to work together. You know what I mean? So the other thing is try to have a vision if you can. And if you don't have a vision, be open to what your designer has for the, their vision for your blog. So, you know, even if you don't have a, a clear vision going from the start, uh, I, I like to give a questionnaire. So even if you don't have a vision, or if you do have a vision, you can, you can express it. And if you don't, I find that the questionnaire really helps to hone that in. Sometimes people say to me, I really don't know and I don't care. Well, then if you, if you don't know and you don't care, then be prepared to accept a designer saying, these are the three things and I need you to pick, or I'm going to pick this for you <laughs> and, and go with it, you know? But I really do think that it's important to, to try to, to know that you could be friendly with that person. Well, have you had any nightmare clients? I'm sure not me, I'm sure, but have you had any people that were difficult to work with, it, you know, in one facet or another that you know, would be good for us to hear what not to do? <laughs> the most, I think one of the most difficult things is when I have taken the time to create something and it's been approved and then implemented and then it needs to be changed. <laughs> they decide that they really don't like it. Now, there's, a, there's different ways of creating a design and mocks for people to approve or not. I find that the best way to do it, I, I used to do Photoshop, um, do you know like a mock-up and send it. And now what I like to do is just automatically set up a test site on my own um, server. I will set it up uh, and and create the mock right in WordPress because I find that it translates better and I have dummy content that I import and so I find that that happens a lot less well it didn't happen a lot to begin with but it happens sometimes and it definitely happens a lot less now that I'm I'm doing the mock right on the a WordPress website so you get a better feel for it and you know it's to scale and your images are better and people feel like they're really visiting a good site. Yeah, I think that's really helpful. I think we did that the last time you helped me with the latest updates I did. And it was much more helpful to see it as a site and to really get a feel for it instead of, I mean, and I used to do kind of my own mock-ups, I think, and and send you like, this is what I think I want, you know, something in like pick monkey, just the very basics of whatever, but you don't get a feel for what a site looks like as much that way. So yeah, I think that's a great way for people to get a chance to sort of test drive what the site will look like with those implementations. Well, Elaine, thank you so much for coming to talk to us about blog design. And I think there's a lot of great insights that you have for why people should work with a designer or when they might work on their own or things that people need to pay attention to. Okay, I did such a long intro. I'm going to do a very short wrapping up here, but I hope that interview was helpful for you. And if you do need resources, head over to the Creative Writing Facebook group because you may be able to find some people who will help you. I know there are people in there, designers in there, or people who can say, here's who I worked with, or here's someone who I hired just to do X, Y, Z, because that tends to be how I do things is just hire somebody to do a couple of the things and then I do what I can or learn what I can. And I know I mentioned her already, but Mary Dennis is working on a free course to get you started on WordPress, which I think is a huge need a lot of people have if you're switching. So anyway, the community is creativewriting.com forward slash community. So head over there if you want to ask questions. Maybe people can ask like, hey, give me feedback on my blog and we can start a thread of people kind of giving feedback to each other. So the community is a really great place. I love connecting with you guys, but it's really fun to connect with you and watch you connect with each other. So that's like my favorite place to hang out. But you can also connect with me via email at creativewriting.com forward slash subscribe. Again, I want you guys to check out the show notes, head over to the site, creativewriting.com forward slash 057 for episode 57. And you can check out Elaine at elainegriffindesigns.com. I've got all the links in the show notes, all the info you'll ever need, at least for today related to this episode. 
So really, that's not all the info you ever need, but it's the info that you need for today. I'm really glad you guys listen. I'm really thankful for how this community has built and just the things that, just the feedback, the responses, the relationships, all the things that have been coming out of this, the fruit of having a podcast lasting over a year, the community, the real sense of getting to know you guys. It's awesome. I love it. So thanks again for listening and being my people. If you're not already subscribed, subscribe. If you have time, leave me a review. I'd love it. It's really annoying to leave reviews on iTunes, but if you do it, more power to you. I'm super like extra thankful because I know how hard it is to do that. Why do you make it so hard, iTunes? Come on. Okay, that's all. I hope you have an inspired week. Oh.